when I still dream of, still dream about this stuff. But you wouldn't think 70 years later you would. But I was 17. Robert Mason was born on February 26, 1927, in eastern Ohio, where he grew up on a farm with his grandparents. I grew up with my father's parents on the farm. We, we raised Jersey cows. Being on the farm, I had to go home and milk cows every night, <laughs> every morning. And so, so we only, we separated the milk, sold cream, we had 500 chickens, so we had a lot of eggs. We sent crates of eggs to town every few days and that, so. Robert's hardworking farm values continued to show through high school as he worked hard to graduate early to be able to enlist in the Navy and serve his country. In order to do it, I had to have enough credits to graduate, so I, uh, I went to night school and I went to summer school to take extra credits so I could graduate a year ahead of time. It's kind of crazy. I, <laughs> when I got in, when I, after I enlisted, I went to boot camp, put in to go aboard a destroyer. And the officer was reading all my file and looking at it and he said, oh, you're a farm kid. He says, can you drive tractors and trucks? I said, yeah. He said, we have just the place for you if you want to volunteer. You have to volunteer for it, and we can put you in the CBs. And so I thought that would be pretty adventurous at 17. Robert soon went off to basic training. CBs first trained with the Marines to prepare for combat. Training for the CBs was much different as Robert's battalion was trained to build an airstrip during battles. They had to be prepared, efficient, and combat ready to execute their job perfectly. Their training lasted four weeks and was called Expeditionary Combat Skills, or ECS. It was kind of strange, you know, there being there with uh, all the different guys, but there were, I guess, about five or six farm kids that were in, uh, in my barracks with me, so we got kind of stuck together all the time. Going up on the farm, I was in perfect condition. So we could uh, run around um, obstacle courses. We could go around that thing like nothing because in climbing ropes, you know, we were used to climbing ropes up in the barn just for the fun of a hand over hand to the top of the barn and back. And so any of that I could just handle easy. The precision marching was something you worried about because you always worried you were going to be the one to make a mistake <laughs> when you had to turn or... Yeah, we were, we were taught to fight by the Marines. We were sent to the Marines to, first to learn how to fight. And then uh, we were on land partner all the time except when we moved from space one place to another. Our battalion was mainly built or trained to build an airstrip in the middle of a battle. You know, we would go in with um, land with the Marines, and then when we got the land where we wanted the the airstrip, why well, then we had all our equipment coming in, and we'd just start with the bulldozers and the graders and that, and build an airstrip. After his training in June 1944. Robert was shipped out to Hawaii. June, sometime in, around the 1st of June in 1944. And well, we le you always leave at night. We went to Hawaii. We had no idea where we were going, but we went to Hawaii. Then there they made up a convoy, and then we went from there to Anawitak. And then they made up another big convoy, and we went to New Guinea. 
We were heading for the invasion of Manawita. We went through a typhoon with 120 foot swells. We ran in and they didn't have satellites and things like they do today. And they had no, weather, no idea that that thing was coming down there. And we ran right into it with the convoy. And uh, the, that, the aircraft Saratoga was running on our beam, on our starboard beam. And uh, she, uh, her deck is 80 feet off the water, the flight deck. And the waves were just washing right straight across that like it was a rowboat. <laughs> It was scary because I was up on the bridge and as a lookout and uh, one DE ahead of us disappeared and went down everybody aboard, I guess. And we lost three ships with everybody and in that. But uh, you're standing up there and you're 30 feet above the main deck and the main deck is about 30 feet off the water and all of a sudden when you plow up, you start up the side of this swell and then all of a sudden the ship plows through it and then everything disappears and sometimes the water be washing up against the windows on the, on the um, deck there where we were in the, up on the bridge. And, uh, it, was, it was a scary mess. And, and it'd roll over so far that the f flying bridge out there would be cutting water. You know, so. um, it was took us 45 days altogether. Um, the first couple of days we were on board, they commandeered us to do KP. And uh, when we got down there, and why well, they asked for two volunteers to help the bakers bake bread. Had to build a thousand loaves of bread a night, and so we volunteered. Another farm kid and I, who were friends, volunteered to do it. And then we liked the job so well that we volunteered to do it all the way across the ocean. From Manawetok, we went to uh, New Guinea. There we were um, preparing equipment. New all we got all new equipment every time we moved to a different, and when every new invasion, we got all new equipment. So we were spending most of our days with uh, cleaning the, co the Cosmoline off of all the equipment and that, you know, all the uh, hydraulic rams and all that stuff on a tractor and the different pieces of equipment. All that was covered with Cosmoline to keep it from rusting and deteriorating. So you had to clean that off with fuel oil and gasoline, and then all the seats were covered with a, that tarp-like stuff that's got tar in the middle of it to protect the, the plastic seats and that. So we had to unbolt all those, take the paper off, and then make sure all the engines were properly oiled and running and all the hydraulic fluid, and that's what we were doing partner all the time until... Uh... After Aniwak in New Guinea, Robert and the Seabees traveled to the Philippines. But throughout the war, they went to many places, such as Tinian, Guam, Okinawa, and Iwo Jima. While in Iwo Jima, Robert and the Seabees were sent there to replace the fallen soldiers who had fought through some of the toughest conditions in the war. Iwo was uh, kind of rough. Guys there were decimated, so they sent us there to uh, take over to build the airstrip in the, on uh, in, on Iwo Jima. There was um, a lot of plane crashes. Um, they would come with uh, both at the Philippines and uh, in Iwo Jima. They would come in the middle of the night, say two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, on a bonsai attack. You know. Uh, two or three hundred of them. And it was crazy because we had everything set up and we'd be waiting for them. And uh, in the morning, you'd find 150, 200 guys dead out there.
the initial battle was over, but there was still fighting to be heck there. Iwo Jima's airfields were functioning even before the island was taken, thanks to the American construction battalions, the CBs. They played a key role here, and indeed in the whole Pacific War. But we needed Iwo Jima for a emergency field because if something happened and they were having a problem, they could they had a place to come in and land, and we had quite a few of them crashing and that. Before the Seabees were ever on Iwo Jima, Robert's battalion was doing work in the Philippines, where he encountered very defining moments in his life. After we had secured the island, but we still had hundreds of guys there, and they would come and attack. Mainly we were, we did build airstrips in the middle of the battle, that while they were bombing us, shooting at us, doing, you know, everything was going on just run out with a truck with gravel and a road grader and fill the holes in and start landing planes again. We had put in a fighter strip first and then uh, when we landed on Samar, we put in the fighter strip in about two hours and then uh, the fighters could come and go and rearm and refuel. And then we worked continuous for 39 hours. We had uh, in a 5,000 foot mesh strip and the first B-24 landed on it. Now they were bombing us, trying to overrun us, everything, you know. I, it was, uh, yeah, you were always under fire when you were, you know, and, until we got the island secure. even after it was secure because the Japanese just ran up in the hills and it wasn't worth wasting lives to go and, and flush them out of there and that, you know, so. When I got shot, that's how I got shot as a sniper, was I was grading the road through the jungle and uh, one day and it's, but. Uh, we had uh, up about halfway up a mountain, we had a sawmill and they were sawing lumber up there, you know, so we could build different you know, for building Quonset huts and buildings and things. And we were building um, a 600 bed evacuation hospital for the invasion of Japan with an airstrip there so they could fly in the injured and that from whatever there we're going. And uh, I'm just riding, going along with, uh, on the grader and uh, a road grader has the controls for the blade and that are up here on a long, they stand up pretty high like this, your arm is up, so that you can stand up or sit down and work it. And I happened to be sitting down in the seat and I had a Marine with a BAR beside me and uh, he was polishing his boots on the wheels, thought it was really, and we were just joking and fooling around and while I'm watching the blade and steering, why uh, somebody shot and it went in my arm here and up in my shoulder and that, so it's... Well, we stopped the grater the minute I just sh shut the thing off and, uh, and he jumped off and, um, and I didn't know, I just thought I'd caught my arm on a limb because it hurt something terrible and uh, 
So I'm there and I felt all how wet my shirt was getting. And so I told the, you know, my friend Duncan, I said, uh, he was a Marine, but he was a friend of mine. And uh, so he just took his knife and cut my shirt and tore it off here and realized that I was shot. So he put a pressure bandage on it. And then we stopped the lumber truck coming down the road. And I got in that and went down to the end of the road. And there just happened to be a young Marine officer there. And he put me in the Jeep and took me to our hospital. Well, they had a, we, the doctors didn't have any, um, uh, anything to kill the pain, you know, when they were, so they said, well, the hospital ship is four hours away, you know, by landing craft. And then he says, we can do it, but it's gonna hurt like heck. So I said, go ahead. So they strapped me down on one of these tables, something like you guys have got here, is what we had, so that I couldn't move. And then he just took those instruments and probed up in there, hurt like heck. And, uh, but he got the shell out and wrapped it up. And uh, two days later, I was back running the grader. Not only was Robert shot in the Philippines, he was put through an extremely tough situation. I was in the Philippines. It was the day we landed there. And the chief sent me down to uh, the shore to see if there was any equipment left down there. And um, the three guys that were driving a weapons carrier, I, he said, find a you know, somebody with a truck and to go down there and see what, if we got everything off the beach and bring it, if there isn't, bring it back. So I just got these three guys that were riding around on a weapons carry and told them that we got, had to go down there and get it and look. And uh, when we got down, well, about a hundred feet from the beach, they stopped and turned the thing sideways. And I just jumped out. Luckily, I took my rifle with me and uh, I went, went down to the water and looked and there was nothing left there, you know, we didn't, we had gotten everything up. I turned around to walk back and I, they took off with the weapons carrier and I thought they were just joking. And so I didn't bother, I thought I'm not gonna go running, you know, and they thought, and they weren't, they just took off and deserted me there, which is mutiny and you know, in the middle of a battle when you, you aren't supposed to leave your buddy regardless of dead or alive. We never left anybody. And uh, so I wasn't, I was trying to figure out what I'd do when, uh, and I would duck in the bush. And these guys, this Japanese patrol come out of the other side and they, all they could see was my shoulders and my helmet. So I slid my rifle, let my rifle, I had it hanging on my shoulder. I left it slide down and I pushed it back under the bushes. And then they came over and motioned for me to sit down on the ground. And they were talking in Japanese and that, and like they were arguing, I don't know. And uh, so they left one guy with me and uh, to guard me. And when we were, went through the marine training, one of the things, you know, we were to, to survive was you had to keep an eye on this guy and you had to be ready to overpower him at any second when he made a mistake. And so he's puttering around there and really dumb. He went and set his rifle down and propped it against a bush away from opposite me. But uh, then he dug in his uniform and he was gonna get out and he got out an old package of American cigarettes and he had a Zippo liner and I knew he had taken them off somebody's body. And uh, so he's trying to straighten out these cigarettes. And I never smoked, but I always carried cigarettes because guys were always looking for a cigarette and especially injured guys when you'd pick them up and put them in the litter and that they'd want a cigarette and I'd just light it for them and give them a cigarette and shove the pack in under their 
blanket or whatever for him. And uh, so I had a couple packs of cigarettes in my thing. And I'm sitting there on the ground and I just took a pack of cigarettes out and I held them up in between my fingers like that. I didn't even look at them. And uh, that really dumbfounded him, I think. He was really taken completely off guard. And so he started opening the package of cigarettes. Then he tried to light it and he couldn't. But when he turned like this to light that cigarette and held his hand up, you know how they do that? Why, I had, in the meantime, I had got up on my feet off of my butt and I had unsnapped my knife and I, uh, when he turned like that, I leaped up right behind him and I luckily I grabbed him right in the eyes, pulled him back and at the same time shoved the knife through his neck like we were taught. And that was, that was it. Was, was I still dream of, still dream about this stuff. But you wouldn't think 70 years later you would. But I was 17. And I went through the bush and kept the ocean in view. So then when, when I got up past the spit, why, uh, and where the ocean you know, was was right on the shore. I went out of the for, out of the bush and looked each way to see if anybody was coming up. And when I looked back to the south, I didn't see any Japanese or anything on the beach. But when I turned around, I was facing a group of Marines, and I had the guys, the Japanese rifle, and I had my rifle. So I just raised my rifle over my head and walked towards them. And, hard to deal with sometimes today more than when you were there and uh, it was uh, I'm sorry as the war came to an end the dark times faded and color showed through with the war ticking down Robert played a pivotal role in ending it he worked on Tinian in constructing the runway that the Anola Gay would take off from. We built the airstrip that it flew out of, yeah. We had no idea what was going on. They sent us back to Guam and over to Tinian to extend the, the runways. And uh, everybody was wondering what are we going to do with these runways that were miles longer than, than, the, uh, than the, for the 24. and then. When one day we were working there and they started coming in with the 29s. Well, then we realized that, you know, that monstrous airplane and stuff. And, but we had no idea they were flying the uh, hydrogen bomb or an atomic weapon out of there then. On August 6, 1945, the first atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. And three days later, the second was dropped on Hiroshima, pushing the Japanese to surrender. On September 2nd, 1945, Robert was there to witness the signing of the Japanese surrender. We went back to the Philippines and we're building some stuff, some a tank farm there. And that's when we got loaded up to go to the invasion of Japan and that's when they decided to surrender. So well, we were the first ones to land in Japan with the Marines when the Japanese then said they would surrender. And we had our ships all loaded and ready to go for the invasion. And so we just, that evening, we were working on a tank farm, you know, for the big 55,000 barrel tanks that, you know, store oil and that in. And one of the officers showed up, one of our officers showed up and told us to, to quit work and go back and load it, pack all our personal gear that we were leaving on the ship at sundown. And uh, that's what we did. We just left everything set and away we went. And 
And I don't think it was about four days later, we entered Tokyo Bay and uh, they sent us to uh, Yokosuka. Occupation began on the 30th, guarded by a cover of aircraft and guns of the 3rd Fleet in Tokyo Bay. U.S. Marines and Blue Jackets walked ashore at the Yokosuka Naval Base, south of Yokohama. About, we were there about two weeks until they signed the armistice, you know, their surrender document. The surrender documents on the Missouri. And that day we were, the Missouri was sitting here and our ship was over here and we could, with binoculars, we were only maybe a quarter mile from them and we could watch them signing the documents and things and coming and going. And that, that's, you were uh, watching something really historical to be able to see, stand there and watch this going on. That, that so it was quite spectacular to see it. One night then uh, we, we, they put us to work unloading ships there in, uh, Japan when we got there and uh, the army was supposed to be there to do this and they didn't get their act together so the admiral put us to work unloading these ships and this one ship come in a merchant ship loaded solid 10,000 tons of beer <laughs> so the officers would all bug out you know they were, the commissioned officers about one o'clock, one thirty, and so the minute the last one left, I told the guys, and I was the highest petty officer there. So I told them, I said, uh, stack up a, a few big cases of beer in a net, and we'll back our dump truck up here, or our truck up here, and load it up. And so they stack, build this cargo net up. We had three hundred and fifty cases of beer in the thing, something like that. We took it over to the Marine Beer Hall. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, we were there till just after Christmas in January then. They were bringing in occupation troops and they took, sent the, all the assault troops. You're different, you have different attitude than the guys that have never been there and seen the atrocities and stuff like that. I, a lot of times we would have just soon shot them as look at them, so, you know, but, uh, so they always move the assault troops out somewhere. They don't leave them there and bring in fresh troops that have never been in, in that, so that you, they can deal with the local people better. When the occupation troops were brought in, Robert and the Seabees were sent to Guam. And even on Guam, after the year after the war, there were hundreds of them up in the hills and that, and they would come and attack for things. And so Halsey, Admiral Halsey was there, and uh, he sent an order out. He said, you get those Seabees and Marines and get them up there in the hills and close those caves and we had worked out a system on Iwo of uh, drilling around the engine, the, the, all around the cave, the mouth of it. We'd drill in there and put in munitions and then blow it. And then we'd just, I'd just take a big tractor and push it all the rubble up against it and pack it in as hard as I could. We'd just go from tunnel to tunnel like that. Before we blew it, we'd pull up a tank and fire napalm into the tunnel and then that it would back away and we'd blow it and then, and then work on, then move to the next one. And we spent, maybe on Guam there, we spent about three weeks going hunting tunnels one after the other. We were stationed on Guam and there we uh, maintained the airstrips. We built four power plants. We went to, over to, uh, Bikini and we set up all the experiments for the atom bomb test there and then with the engineers and and scientists and then we went back and cleaned up the mess or whatever you want to call it and that and then we went uh, 
The Admiral come in one day in the movie one evening and said that uh, he was going to send us on a summer vacation. And uh, so he sent us to Antarctica to build some barracks and, or some buildings at, Anna, or at the South Pole at McMurno Base in their summertime. <laughs> On a nice day, like a bright, sunshiny day, it might get up to zero. <laughs> we got in just as the ice was breaking up, and we had fallen an icebreaker for about three or four days to get into to the Ross Sea there and tie up by the ice. And then I think it, it took me about an hour or a little over an hour on a D7 and uh, to pull the sleds into the base from the ship across the ice pack and uh, back and forth. We were building buildings for some kind of science project. There were scientists and engineers that, and they wouldn't tell us what they were doing there. So we built about a half a dozen buildings. And, uh, I don't know, they would never tell us what they had. We were calling up, I was hauling up some kind of instruments and things that were all crated up in big wooden crates and they wouldn't let us open them or anything until we got them in the buildings and then they did whatever they were gonna do with them. When the war was over, not all times were serious. We did a lot of crazy things. And our uh, engineering office threatened me at least once a week to break me down to apprentice seaman. <laughs> um, one time the guys wanted coconuts and we were building a water tower for the diesel generators up on, we had taken and went up on the mountain up above the power plant. We just blasted out the side of the hill in a flat spot and we were putting the water tower up there, the big cooling tower. One day they wanted coconuts and they couldn't find a native kid to crawl up the tree and chop them out. You know, they could go up the tree and put their feet on the tree and their hands and go right up. So I, I said, oh, heck, I'll push the thing over. So I just pushed the tree over and, and our engineering officer drove up in his Jeep. And he just looked at me and says, did you, did you push that tree over? I said, yeah. I said, the guys want a coconut. He says, you know that we have to pay $32 for each tree. So he says, you're at $32 plus $10 fine coming out of your pay this month. Yeah. I wouldn't have been fooling around like that during the war. We, you know, we're too serious working then. But, uh, that, and then uh, in Japan, the, the crew chief came over and told me one day, you know, we, he says, dig a hole here. They were unloading. The Marines were taking all these guns and munitions out of a factory there where they built, where they made their rifles and they made and different small arms and things and munitions. So they came and I had dug this hole, but I scooped it out with the tractor. So the Marines bought, brought the, the first truckload they come, the guy comes in this dump truck and it's all live ammo. And we're standing there and I said, I only dug the hole. You know, he says, what are we gonna do with it? You know how, how it is if you've been in the service. And uh, so I said, well, I'll go down and push out another hole in the bottom of this thing, but don't dump anything down there till I back out of there. So that's what I did and they dump, we dumped it down in the bottom and nothing blew up or that. So they said, well, don't you think you should go down and cover it up? I says, I'm not driving down there. <laughs> All I have to do is hit one case and I'm not being. So anyway, we dumped all the rifles and all the stuff they brought and it was just about full. And the chief come by and he said, why don't you, now a D7 weighs 20 ton. So he says, why don't you take that thing and crush all that stuff. You know, we got more truckloads that come in. And I gingerly <laughs> drove out over it because I thought, what's going to happen when I start crushing this with all that munition? But nothing happened and it collapsed about three feet. And we finished. And uh, then the chief said, well, when you get done, they get all that. 
go get some oil and, and set that thing on fire before you burn it. So we went and got 50 gallon of oil, fuel oil, and laid two chains out and rolled it up on it and then hooked them over the top of the blade and lifted up the blade, drove back with it. And then stepping open up the big hole, I opened just the small hole so it'd gulp out slowly and I'd back back and forth, back and forth over the pile. And finally the ch one chain let loose and it dropped off in the middle of the pile. So I just backed out of there and I asked the Marines, I said, you guys got a fl any flares with you? And they said, yeah. So I said, shoot a couple in there and get it going. And well, once it got going, we had flames going 100 feet in the air and black smoke billowing up, you know, how it rolls up. And geez, I'm standing there and, the, I, and we're, we have to keep backing away from the thing, you know. And uh, so I happened to be looking down the street and I seen this blue um, command car come around and I knew it was fleet officers coming. And uh, so this officer comes there, a, a full, uh, full lieutenant, and he had two ensigns with him who must have just got out of Annapolis because they didn't have any, they didn't have a wrinkle in their uniform. They didn't have a speck of dirt or anything. It, they were immaculate, you know, it looked compared to us with the oil and dirt and everything all over us. and. Uh, so they were just raising. He said, what is going on here? And he's raising it. Like he said, the Admiral thinks of war. What are you guys doing, blowing up the city or what's going on? And we told him what we were doing there. And he said, how much oil did you put on it? I said, oh, I just went and got a drum of oil. You know, he said, 50 gallons? I said, yeah, I just dumped it in there. What the heck? And <laughs> I'm a 19-year-old kid. What do you expect? <laughs> and so, isn't that right about, you know? And so, uh, anyway, why are he, they, and in the midst of all him talking and that, this barrel got hot and it blew up and it's up in the air tumbling and like a big cartwheel. The oil is spraying out of that hole in a big... <laughs> stream and he looks and the young officer looks at him and he says what is going on here sir he says it's he says we're going to get the hell out of here he says it's one of these goddamn marine CB operations <laughs> and when congressman moss of minnesota saw the cbs in action at rattle he reported when Jap attacks were made, I saw CBs working on Henderson Field drop their tools, pick up their rifles, and fight side by side with the Marines. We had to do a job, and you just went. You were afraid. There was a f you were had a fear, but uh, for some reason you could work and function, even though uh, some people were getting shot or injured or some darn thing, you know. And, Usually you had uh, the work to do and um, it was scary, but it was surprising how you could work and that even though that fear was there all the time and uh, the, and you had your rifle, you had all your, you had your helmet on, you had all your equipment with you, you had hand grenades, you had all this stuff tied on you while you were working, you know. Uh, the CB is a, you know, they were, were, if the Marines needed help, we stopped, dropped everything and went and up to the line and helped them. So. Other questions here? Carson? I have some questions. This is the exact same spot I sat in for Robert's interview. I was a note taker that day and just sitting there listening to his story absolutely astounded me. The amazing achievements he had had in his life and just the amazing heartfelt stories just really impacted me and inspired me. It just compelled me to make it. Those moments of silence in there, I find are the most meaningful things. 
And I feel like you can learn so much out of those few seconds of just him thinking or remembering those moments can teach you way more than you could ever learn from a textbook. I, it's an amazing opportunity I've had that not many people get. People don't get to listen to the stories that veterans have. And I feel like that's a sad thing to do because I think everyone should have that opportunity to learn what they went through. You learn so much from him just sitting there silent that you can never learn from anywhere else. That I feel is so valuable is why we listen to these veterans' stories.